Hello everybody, my name is Donatel Relia, I'm a junior scientist at the Advanced Scientific Computing Division of the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change Foundation, as well as a PhD student at the University of Salento. In this lab tutorial, I'm going to provide some preliminary information useful for the hands-on exercise you'll find in the virtual lab of the High Performance Data Analytics and Visualization session of this summer school, and also show some examples of usage of the FIDA framework from its Python interface called Pyrophilia. We'll start with a brief introduction of the Jupyter Notebook software, and we'll then have a look at the Pyrophilia library that we're going to use extensively both during the tutorial and the virtual lab. After that, I'll provide some information about the VMI environment for the virtual lab, as well as an overview of the ECAS lab service. Finally, we'll conclude the tutorial with a complete example of one of the Jupyter notebooks you'll find in the virtual machine and also on Ecoslab. Jupyter Notebook, maintained by Project Jupyter, is an open source web application which allows creating and sharing documents containing live code, equation, plots, and also text. It provides an interactive computing environment for development and execution of code. Besides the execution, the notebook document allows also to show and save the result and also document the code. This makes it easy to share not only the code, but also the results in a single interactive document. It is a very effective instrument for training a tutorial, and we'll be using it during the hands-on. Jupyter Notebook can connect to different kernels, which provide support for various programming languages. During this tutorial and the virtual lab, we'll be using only Python, and hence the IPython kernel. Another interesting software developed by Project Jupyter is Jupyter Hub, which provides a multi-user server for Jupyter Notebooks. Additional information about Jupyter Notebooks and the other software supported by Project Jupyter can be found on our website at the link at the bottom of the slide. I'll now introduce Pyophilia, the Ophidia Python bindings, an open source Python library developed by CMCC to interact with the Ophidia framework. It represents the programmatic interface for the framework. The library provides two main classes the client class and the cube class. The client class implements the logic to establish a connection with the FIDA server and manage the submission of commands and workflows and interpretation of their responses. It also takes care of managing the sessions. The cube class, on the other hand, provides a more user-friendly interface abstracting from the declarative format used to define the operator commands in the client class. It implements a data cube type of a structure through an object-oriented approach defining the cube data type in Python, which refers to remote data cubes on the server side, and maps all the operators as a method of the cube class. This class builds on the client class to manage the client-server interaction. In this and the following slides, I give you a quick overview of the Pyofida interface by showing the core functionalities that will be used for the demo and hands-on notebooks in the virtual lab through a set of examples. As mentioned in the previous slide, the cube class supports all the feed operators as methods of the class. However, from an implementation standpoint, these come in two different fashion. The first being the class methods, which aren't specific to a particular object, but are related to the whole class. These are used to implement all the operators which are not related to a specific cube for example, those for importing data or for managing the file system, like the list operator in the slide. These methods are called by using the cube.cube .cube format. The second type of methods are regular instance methods, which refer to a specific object and are used for all the operators which apply to a specific cube and can hence create a new cube as output. These do not only refer to data processing operators, like the reduce, but also to metadata operator such as the info method. As we'll see in the notebooks, after importing the cube module, uh, which is this first line in the code snippet, the first instruction that must be called is the set client class method, which tries to establish a connection with the FIDA server based on the arguments provided. If the server authorizes the client, it will reply with a set of information concerning the last active session. The connection arguments, which are hostname, port, username, and password, 
can also be automatically inferred from the environment if these have been exported, for example, through the Bouchard C file. In this case, we can set the read M equal to true. Once the connection has been set up, we can call all the instances and class methods of the cube model to submit the corresponding operators on the Ophelia server side components. A cube object can be created in multiple ways, as shown in the slide. Basically, we can identify two scenarios. The case where we already have a data cube in the Ophelia framework and we want to use this from the Python modules. The cube class constructor can be used to create a new cube object in Python and link it with the remote data cube based on its persistent identifier, which is this speed argument. In the second case, where we need to create a new data cube from an HDF file, in this case we can specify the list of arguments, such as the file path, the variable to import, the dimensions, and other information from the class constructor. This will load the data in a new data cube in the Ophelia framework, as well as link it to the MyCube object in Python. The constructor is directly mapped to the OPH import and C operator, which is responsible for loading the data. In fact, the two interfaces we can see are very similar. The delete method allows deleting the cube both remotely, the actual data, and also on the Python side, the MyCube object. This slide shows some examples of data analytics operators that can be applied on cube objects, for example, for data reduction, subsetting, and aggregation. Each of these methods can be executed in parallel on the data cube fragments based on the encores argument. Every method creates a new data cube remotely and a cube object on the Python side. The function can be also concatenated into a single Python line, as we can see in the last code snippet, in order to track just the final data cube resulting from the pipeline of operators. To conclude this overview of Pyophidia, we can now see an example where the client class should be directly used. In this case, operators are specified together with the argument using the key value format, as we can see in this OPH list command. A single method, submit, is used to submit any type of command to the server side. And this will also take care of managing the response from the server. Although being less intuitive than the cube class, it is more flexible and allows the execution of massive operators, which are operators applied concurrently on multiple input data. The slide shows two examples of massive operators. In the first one, we are importing multiple cubes in parallel from the input folder. Filters on the source path can be specified in square brackets in order to trim down the selection. In the second example, we are running the reduce operator on multiple input data cubes. The filter, again in square brackets, will select all the cubes currently available in the Ophelia virtual file system. After the short introduction of tools and library, we'll now see a brief demo of a notebook with some simple examples of analysis implemented with Biophilia. For this demo, I'm going to use ECAS Lab, but you can find the same notebook with just minor differences also on the Ophidia virtual machine image provided for the Summer School Virtual Lab. We'll now have a quick look at what you'll find on the VM. Here you can see the virtual machine that has been set up for the Virtual Lab on High Performance Data Analytics. I'll provide a quick walk through the environment. First of all, check the README file located on the desktop. This file provides some instruction that must be executed every time the VM is rebooted in order to manually start up some services. Also check that you have the latest version of the training material. The notebooks are located on the desktop under the ECAS training folder. To get for update, just run the git pull command into the folder and this will check if there is any update on the github repository. Please also refer to the instruction on the summer school website to get the most updated info before running the notebooks. Once the environment has been uh, started you can run the Jupyter notebook application from the shell 
a window on the browser will pop up with the interface of the Jupyter Notebook. Notebooks are located in this notebook folder. We're dividing this in demo and hands-on. The notebook we are going to showcase in the tutorial is the ECAS Basics Notebook. The outline notebook provides a summary of all the notebooks available in the folder. I'll now provide a quick overview of the ECAS Lab service. With respect to the virtual machine, which is limited to the laptop or machine resources, ECAS Lab provides access to a small multi-node cluster for data analysis. ECAS Lab has been set up in the scope of the EOSCAB European project by CMCC and DKZ, which provide also the two main instances of the service. This is the main page of the instance set up at CMCC. Here you can find some information about ECAS and what it offers. Briefly, ECAS Lab goal is to provide a user-friendly environment for scientific data analysis, in particular in the field of climate change, and it integrates analysis tools together with computing resources and datasets. It combines the feature of the ENES Climate Analytics Service, in brief ECAS, with Jupyter Hub and a set of Python modules. The FIDA framework is one of the core components of ECAS, and it can be easily integrated in Jupyter Notebook by using the PyFIDA model. CMCC ECAS instance is also one of the computing platforms made available by the ISNIS3 project through the transnational access call. If you are interested in getting access to the platform, even just for running some demo notebooks, you can simply click on the register link in the top part of the web page. Here provide the required information and select, uh, in the case of the summer school, ISNIS3 as project and then specify the motivation for uh, requiring access. You can simply type training. Once the access will be granted, you will be able to log in to the Jupyter Hub service with the provided credentials. And you will find some folders providing data and notebook for training and demonstration purposes. Among these, we can find the ECAS Basic Notebook, which we are going to see in the demo. You can try following the execution running the notebook on the VM step by step during the video. This notebook provides some basic examples of how to use the FIDA framework features for analysis of climate data. In particular, it showed some of the main commands of the PyFIDA model. In the first cell of the notebook, we are importing PyFIDA models, cube and client, and we set up a connection with the server side to the set client method. In the case of ECASLAB, the arguments have been exported in the environment, and thus, by setting the readm to true, the function will automatically retrieve this information. We can run the cell by pressing the Run button on the top part of the Jupyter interface, or by pressing Shift-Enter. After we run this cell, the text displayed below shows that the method was able to successfully contact the server. In the second cell of the notebook, we are importing an etcdf file from the training data folder, with the importency method, which correspond to the OPH importency operator. This file is a part of a SMIP5 dataset produced by CMCC from the CESM model. It contains a tridimensional variable called TASMAX, which represents the maximum near surface air temperature. The variable is organized with respect to time, latitude, and longitude dimensions. Here, we are specifying through the impdim argument that we want to import the data so that the values on the array are organized according to the time dimension. This will improve the efficiency of the analysis we're going to run. We're also using two cores to speed up the import process. The method creates a new data cube on the FIDA server side components by loading data on the IO and analytics servers. At this stage, nothing is being read from the file on the notebook. My cube object contains just a reference to the cube on the server side. We'll see how to access this later on. We can inspect the user virtual file system with the list method. This shows we have a cube in the user space created from the previous command. The PID provides a persisting unique identifier associated to this cube. The description argument used in the import helps to relate the data cube to the operator in a more mnemonic way. A 
If you want to get additional information about the methods and their arguments, we can use the Python help function to check the inline documentation. Here we see all the arguments and the possible values for the list method. To inspect the cube structure and its dimension, as well as how it has been partitioned, we can run the info method on the MyCube object. The output shows that the cube has been partitioned on five IO analytic servers, each one managing 10 fragments. It also shows the total data size and number of elements. The dimension information table shows the cube dimension jointly with the sizes. We can see that, as requested in the import and C command, the time dimension is the one used as implicit array dimension. Once the first cube has been created, we can run the feed operators to possess the data. In this cell, we are performing a subset of the original cube on multiple dimensions by specifying the subsetting range for each one. The method is quite flexible and allows the user to specify one or more of the cube dimensions. In this case, we are using the actual dimension values, but there's also the option to specify the dimension indexes by changing the subset type argument from chords to index. The method will create a new data cube object without modifying the original one, still on the service side component. My cube 2 will just hold the reference to this new cube. If we inspect this cube structure with the info method, we notice that now each dimension size is smaller with respect to the original cube. The explore method allows us to see the value stored in a data cube. The limit filter argument tells the method to retrieve just the first line. In this case, the temperature values associated to the first latitude and longitude point. The method allows also specifying subset filters, as in subset method, in order to inspect only the data we are interested in. This is very important to avoid unrequired data movement, since this function is designed only for data inspection and not for retrieving data blocks. We'll see how to retrieve a whole data cube in one of the next commands. Here we can see the values associated to this first line of the data cube. Let's now perform a data reduction operator on the subsetted cube to compute, for example, the maximum over the whole time series. This is accomplished through the reduce method, which is one of the most used for analysis together with subset. The argument operation specified that we want to compute the maximum over the array. This method supports a wide set of data reduction operations like minimum, average, standard deviation, and also others. You can check the feed operator's documentation to get all the possible options available. The info method on this cube shows that the time dimension has been completely aggregated. So we now have a two-dimensional cube of maximum temperatures, basically a map. We can reorganize the cube with the rollup method to handle it more efficiently in the following steps. This transforms the longitude dimension into an array-oriented dimension, as it was before for the time dimension. The info method shows that cube 4 has now longitude as array-oriented dimension. Time dimension is just kept for back reference, although in practice the dimension doesn't exist anymore. If we run again the list method, we can see that at this point we are creating multiple data cubes. The description we added in the previous method helps us understand to which operator it relates. Now that we've run a data reduction operation, we could use the results to create a map. The export array method allows moving the data from the service line components into a Python friendly structure on the notebook. The data retrieved from Ophidia can be easily used with other Python libraries such as Cartopy, BaseMap, or NumPy, but also others. It is worth noting that at this stage, the data size of MyCube 4 has been significantly reduced with respect to the original imported file. 
And this is important since this is the first time in the tutorial that we are moving the full data from the server side to the notebook. As we can see from the picture, the structure return is basically a Python dictionary with two main keys, a measure for the cube values and dimensions. The measure contains a single subdictionary with a full list of the variable values, organized according to the dimension order. Whereas the dimension key contains multiple subdictionaries, one for each dimension. We see the output of the cell basically follows the same structure of the picture. With of course a much higher number of values shown. In this cell we have a function implemented using cardpy and matplotlib for the plotting, as well as numpy for minor adjustments to the data structures that creates the map starting from the dictionary-based representation. In this function, we are using the measure and dimension keys to access the values from the exported data. Details on the function implementation are out of the scope of this tutorial. You can have a look at the documentation of these Python modules if you are interested in understanding how they work. We can see in the result of this cell as we initially subsetted the data on all dimensions, that the map shows just a portion of the whole globe. So, what if we want to consider the full spatial domain for our analysis instead of a subset? We can do this by applying a different subset on the original imported cube referenced by the MyCube object. Since every operation creates a new cube, the original one is still available in the cube space and we don't need to import it again, which happens to be good because import is one of the most time-consuming operations. In this case, we are subsetting only on the time dimension, using a filter in a more human, readable format, specifying the ranges as dates. This can be done by setting a time filter argument to yes. The new cube will now have the full length of the latitude and longitude dimension, but just a portion of the time dimension as we can see from the info method. We can then rerun some of the previous operators in order to aggregate data on the time dimension and reorganize it. And then export this data and plot it on the map using the same function introduced before. We can see the map now shows the temperature over the full spatial domain. Let's now consider a different scenario. We want to plot the minimum value for each point on the spatial grid. So we can start from the previous MyNewCube2 object, the last subset one, and we run the reduce method with operation set to minimum. By using the same method and functions described before, we can get the new map, which shows now the minimum temperatures for this dataset. We have run several operators during this demo, so now our virtual file system contains multiple cubes. Since we are done with analysis, we can clear the space and delete all the cubes with the delete container method. As we can see, it is now empty, and this concludes this introductory notebook. I'll now move to the conclusion of this lab tutorial presentation. This tutorial aims to provide you with the basic knowledge to allow you to run other notebooks with Pyophidia on your own. As previously stated, you'll find some hands-on and demo notebooks in the virtual machine of the virtual lab so that you can experiment with Pyophidia and ECAS yourself. It is worth mentioning that with respect to the demo on ECAS lab, where a multi-node cluster is used, on the VM, the client and server side of the Fidia, of course reside in the same machine. Finally, if you're also interested in testing the ECAS features over a multi-node cluster, please feel free to apply for an account on ECAS Lab. I leave you with some useful links and reference to a documentation pages if you're interested in learning more about the tools. With this, I end the presentation and thank you for following the lab tutorial. For any question, I remind you of the question and answer session on Friday.